Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us today for the webinar titled Integration of Company Culture and the Role of Engineering of Record, presented by Patrick Corser and sponsored by Stantec. Thank you, Stantec. My name is Jackie, and I will be serving as your host for today's session. Attendees may submit questions at any time during the presentation by using the chat panel. I will read the questions aloud to our speaker during the Q&A session following his presentation. This webinar will explore the intersection of consulting company culture and owner culture with the role of engineering of record that is required to continually improve the performance of a tailing storage facility throughout the mine's life cycle. Patrick Corser is a Stantec Senior Vice President and has more than 30 years of engineering and construction experience working on mining, civil, geotechnical, and environmental projects. I am now pleased to turn the session over to our speaker. Pat, would you share your screen with us? Sure. Let me know if you can see that. Looks great. Please proceed. Okay. Uh, thank you, Jackie, for that introduction. I guess it was back in uh, late last late last year at the 2020 SME conference. There was a session on the role of culture in the safety of tailing storage facilities. Talks were presented by industry representatives, consultant representatives, and they presented their views on issues of culture, some of their tactics, company procedures, and uh, use of review boards. As part of that, I was asked to talk about the integration of culture and the role of engineer of records. So I'm gonna give you my perspective on culture as it relates to uh, safe tailing dam management from the perspective of an EOR, basically the consultant side of the industry. Three things I'll touch on in the presentation, my view of culture, it's something we all know and feel, but it's sometimes hard to define. I'll provide examples of how a change in culture within our industry has resulted in step change in the performance of our industry. And then provide some examples of how Stantec is embracing and enhancing a culture around tailing dam safety. I'll present some of the tactics that we're using to develop that culture. They're only examples uh, that we're prepared to share with this group. I'm certain there are many other consultants on this phone call that have their own and hopefully through other mechanisms they can share their tactics for improving the industry for the, the uh, benefit of society. First, a little bit about my experience. Uh, I've been servicing the mining industry for the last 40 years. And over the last 20 years, I have uh, I've been EOR for six tailing dams. Most recently, the Sarah Corona facility, which is a Rockville dam based and uh, located in Peru and for the Cerro Verde uh, sand dams at En Lozada in Linga, also in Peru. I'm uh, currently a senior reviewer for both facilities, and I believe my time working on the, these sites has helped me try to understand how culture can improve the performance of these facilities. So what is culture? It's a tough question, but in very simple terms, this is it. The fact that we're hosting a webinar, you're attending the webinar. SME had a session uh, at their annual conference that lasted the whole week. There were presentations by a number of representatives. The keynote speaker talked about uh, tailing dam safety as part of the kickoff of the whole SME conference. So I'm a firm believer that what we talk about in meetings like this defines our culture. So I think we're taking a positive step forward just by having this. We're not talking about ways to cut costs for tailings facilities. We're not talking about ways to permit tailings facilities faster. We're talking about improving the safety of tailing storage facilities. Culture is passed on in an organization and in an industry. And generally it tries to pass on a consistent culture. 
but at times culture must change and it evolves over time. It takes a lot of work to maintain culture because there's new people coming in and out of an organization and it takes even more time and effort to evolve the culture to change it. It's hard work. But some typical definitions of culture include a culture is a way of life of a group, of people. The behaviors, beliefs, values, and symbols that they accept generally without thinking about them, sort of ingrained in the work we do, how we do it, how we react to each other, how we react to our colleagues and our peers and to communities. Every organization, including consulting engineers and mining companies, have a unique culture that has developed over many years and determines how they operate. Culture, therefore, greatly influences how structures like tailing storage facilities are designed, constructed, operated, and monitored. Now, I'm no expert in cultural um, development within companies. I'm a geotechnical engineer. So I, as part of preparing this, I did some research as to how it is viewed in the industry and came across a paper by PwC, PricewaterhouseCoopers, on some surveys they did within industry about culture. And I think it points out some interesting uh, features that's worth uh, uh, talking about. First of all, looking at cultural outlook, they looked at the upper end of an organization and asked the question, um, uh, who, who drives culture and how important is it? Basically 60% of the respondents indicated that culture is more important than strategy and operating model. So it's clearly viewed uh, quite important by senior management. And 84% believe culture is critical to business success. So again, I think senior management sees the importance of culture. A step down, maybe mid-level management, 51% think a major overhaul is currently needed in their culture. Maybe they don't necessarily buy into the corporate view of culture. Only 35% think their company's culture is effectively managed. So there appears to be some breakdown in uh, between senior management and uh, the next tier of management. Who's driving the change? The question was asked, who should, who should be responsible for cultural change? I found it interesting that it was about a 50-50 split, 43 to 42, between people saying it's the CEO that should be responsible for cultural change and it should be all employees. That seems about right to me. I think there's, a, there's value in that being balanced. But the other question that was asked is who is in charge of cultural change? Nearly 60% claim the CEO or other senior managements senior management are driving uh, cultural change. And only 14% say that all employees are currently responsible for change. So I think that's, um, I think that's a disconnect. I think that's something that has to change. I think uh, employees uh, throughout the organization should have more input into culture and cultural change. And let me explain why. <clears throat> This is a graphic I'll spend a little time trying to explain. It comes from a consultant, Torben Rick, who does work with uh, companies to evaluate their culture and help them figure out how to change their culture. It makes an analogy between culture and an iceberg. Uh, as we all know, 10% of an iceberg, the mass is above water and 90% is below water. This is analogous to culture with a few components above water and a number of components below water. The above water components consists of strategy, shared values, vision, uh, policies, uh, and many of these are components that are posted on websites or in company brochures. They're very public, they're advertised, everybody can see them and find them. They tend to be the way we say we get things done, very visible, very public. However, the majority of cultural components are below water. 
These include things like beliefs, perceptions, values, traditions, unwritten rules, stories. They're not always visible. They're not written down or they're not publicly available. They're just talked about within a company or they're viewed by employees by viewing actions of other employees in the company. But they tend to indicate the way we really get things done. Now, I can't view the audience in this presentation, but I would ask all of you to raise your hand if you understand the difference between the way we say we get things done and the way we really get things done within your organization. I'll talk more about some of the below water components in a minute as they apply to tailing storage facilities. So many of you may be asking at this point, we understand a little about, about culture and how it's defined, et cetera, but how does it really improve the performance of tailing dams? And I contend that um, yes, it does, and it can make a difference. And let me give you some examples of how cultural change in our industry has had an improvement in performance. The first example is around safety. When I started working in the industry about 40 years ago, safety was not a huge issue. It wasn't a real focus by senior management. It wasn't a focus of people in the field. There were accidents, there were near misses, there were fatalities. And there was concern about it, but there wasn't a focus on trying to change that, trying to improve the performance. But I believe over the last 15 to 20 years, the mining industry has led the way in changing the culture around health and safety. And they have made substantial improvements that have reduced injuries and accidents. And they've done that by uh, making it an important goal, making it a KPI, hosting uh, safety shares, safety topics, uh, talking about every talking about it every day before people go in the field and do their work or or start a day in the office. And as the graph below indicates, this is from ICMM, and it plots out total total recoverable injuries and frequency rates between 2012 and 2018. And you can see there's been a steady decrease with time. It doesn't happen overnight. It takes time. But I believe the mining industry has come a long ways and the consultant industry has followed that lead in improving uh, their accident rates. And uh, it's been to the benefit of the entire industry. So hopefully many of you have seen that in your daily lives at work or working on sites, that safety is important. It's part of the culture and it has improved the performance. There's another example I'd like to share with you. I attended the Tailing and Mineways Conference uh, towards the end of last year, and uh, Professor Morgan Stern presented the keynote address. And he referenced the sixth Victor DeMello lecture that he gave in 2018, I believe. It was entitled Geotechnical Risk, Regulation, and Public Policy. And as part of that presentation, he highlighted how a safety culture in Hong Kong uh, around slope stability uh, and the associated fatalities that were occurring there uh, improved because uh, recommendations that they made changed the culture. And I believe that this graph highlights that. Uh, many of you are aware that there's challenging geotechnical conditions in Hong Kong. There's also been a tremendous amount of rapid growth that's occurred there. They have uh, extreme weather conditions, rainfall, and other issues that threaten slopes. And the development has required them to do a lot of uh, slope stability studies. Well, in the mid-1900s, 1950 to say 1976, drastic increase in development, uh, a number of slope stability uh, failures occurred and there were a number of fatalities. Around 1972, the government said this is not acceptable and we need to change this. They commissioned a group to come in and study what they needed to do to address this. Professor Morgan Stern was part of that commission and he indicated that they, uh, they developed a, a safety culture 
It's not just identifying a factor of safety they should use or a particular method of analysis, but a culture with a variety of components that was going to have to be implemented to address these failures. It resulted in a substantial reduction in uh, the, uh, the, the failures in the associated facilities. Um, as part of their recommendations they adopt, that were adopted by the government in 1977, the Geotechnical Engineering Office was set up at a government level and its requirements were spread across the entire territory. Over the ensuing years, they developed specific uh, recommendations uh, that included uh, cataloging slopes, high-risk slopes, low-risk slopes, ones that should be addressed immediately, the development of suitable prescriptive design measures, soil testing procedures, supported by a considerable checking of designs, review boards, and they all contributed to the evolution of safety culture of excellence. And within a decade, as you can see in this graph, enormous progress had been made as reflected in the marked decline of annual landslide fatality, fatality rates. It was recognized early on that to reduce risk, a slope safety system had to evolve that not only set standards for new slopes, but also addressed existing slopes, uh, landslide warning systems, advanced emergency planning, uh, and public education on what was critical to slope stability. These, uh, all these components came, became part of their safety culture and as you can see, resulted in a substantial reduction of fatalities. So I, I appreciate him sharing that uh, because I think it shows what culture can do. Both of these examples show, I think, what uh, culture can do to improving performance in our industry. So now to address how does this fit in with an EOR role? Uh, how does it fit in with tailing facilities? Uh, let me talk a little bit about that. First of all, I think it's important that all the stakeholders that are involved need to adopt and implement a similar culture to make a facility uh, function as we intended to. There are a lot of people that are involved in uh, developing, designing, constructing, managing, and, and monitoring a tailings facility. It includes the mining company, the corporate, entity. They help define the culture with the above water components of culture. Maybe more at the mining facility level are more of the cultural components that are below water and they're, they need to be aligned with the mining company. And the EOR culture needs to be aligned with both of those other entities to make an effective team that can improve the performance of a tailings facility. They need to complement each other. They, they need to work together uh, to make that work. <clears throat> this is another uh, graphic that was produced by Torben Rick that uh, makes an analogy to an iceberg. It's called the iceberg of ignorance. And through years of his consulting practice, talking to companies, surveying them, talking to people up and down the organizational chart of a company, he identified the uh, ignorance that can occur within an organization. And these numbers are pretty extreme. They may not apply to every industry or every company, but they're uh, interesting. He contends that only 4% of problems are known to top managers. They're generally not out in the field. They don't see facilities. They can only react to and respond to what they're told but only 4% of problems are known by the upper management. 9% are known by mid-managers, still not very much, but 74% of problems or issues within an organization or a functioning facility are known by supervisors, and nearly 100% are known by frontline employees. So there's a huge knowledge gap between frontline employees and senior management. And you know, based on my experience uh, walking a number of facilities and sites that until you do that and you listen to people who are in the field, whether they're the QC team or the QA team or supervisors, 
and talk to them about their jobs and what concerns them. You really don't know all the problems. And it's really the role of a uh, challenge for an engineer of record to learn that, understand that, and then if there are substantial issues, communicate that to upper management so they can be addressed. It's a huge uh, challenge that I think we as engineers of records around tailings facilities have to address. And I believe the answer lies in thinking about the below water cultural components. So I'm going to talk a little bit about a few of these that are below water. I'm going to talk about values, structure, norms, stories, and perceptions that relate to tailing storage facilities. The first one is uh, uh, values. Um, again, I've mentioned that the performance of a TSF is influenced by many internal and external stakeholders. Input from all the stakeholders must be understood and evaluated as part of the whole facility assessment. And it requires active engagement of all the people that are involved, mining companies, site operations, environmental teams, EOR teams, and regulatory representatives. And they need to uh, observe things in the field. They need to listen to frontline employees. They need to take their comments seriously and evaluate them. And if there are issues, they need to be addressed. I think that's extremely important that that component of culture is communicated to all the key stakeholders and representatives. Uh, structure. Uh, I think there's some structural components in culture around tailings facilities that are important. I think the assignment of an external EOR and also a responsible dam engineer from the owner's organization, and that they foster a relationship between the two of them. I think it's essential to curating the history and preserving the integrity of a TSF. The uh, EOR needs to identify technical issues, be involved with conducting or reviewing designs, implementing construction quality assurance programs, reviewing QC data, uh, reviewing and monitoring instrumentation information. And I think that a responsible dam engineer needs to be knowledgeable in all those disciplinaries, disciplinary areas and needs to uh, be a partner with the engineer of record. And if issues come up, recommendations are made by the EOR, the responsible dam engineer has to buy into those and possibly take that to senior management request the funding and request the actions that are required to address those problems. I think that team is very important. I think an engineer of record alone operating on an island without an avenue to upper management in a mining company will not be as effective without a responsible dam engineer. I also think it's important to appoint deputies for both of these positions because these are long-term assignments. Hopefully an engineer of record is a long-term assignment with a company that does not bid out every year because you lose all the institutional knowledge, all the history, and the real benefit of an engineer of record and responsible dam engineer is the continuity and consistency that they can provide on the history. So I think deputies are important because um, these are big positions. There are a lot of responsibility and people need to be trained in it. They need to be mentored. They need to be coached. And assigning a deputy that can work hand in hand with the primary engineer of record, the primary responsible dam engineer, is the best way to give them that training. So if there's a period when the EOR is not available, somebody can step in and uh, make an assessment, provide recommendations immediately. And it can also facilitate uh, succession planning so that there's a set procedure time frame for succession planning and the person that's going to step into that role is trained and ready to hit the ground on day one. I think it's, it's very important to have that structure. Norms. Um, there are various uh, groups within the uh, mining industry that are developing norms, standards, guidance documents, for the role of an engineer of record, how their uh, role should be performed, uh, what sites need an engineer of record, 
and they identify standard procedures for planning, designing, permitting, monitoring, uh, dam performance monitoring, and emergency planning. I think those procedures that are being developed by SME, uh, CDA, ICMM are important. They, they need to evolve as they're developed to be consistent with each other. But then the engineer of record and the responsible dam engineer need to adopt those and implement them. Not just read them and put them on a shelf, but they need to implement the recommendations in them that will drive improved performance. Um, stories and perceptions. Uh, I think this one is very important. Um, you know, stories, in my view, define a lot of culture. And what we hear in stories are things that aren't published. We hear the good and the bad. And I think there's an analogy to health and safety. I mean, we've all sat through a number of lessons learned, near misses, things that went well or didn't go well, uh, near misses where we just avoided an accident. And without talking about those issues, we're really not learning about what works and what doesn't work. I think the uh, engineering industry, the EOR industry needs to do a better job of communicating those types of things. There's been a lot of hesitation about sharing what doesn't work, uh, but I think we need to get over that and uh, be able to talk, not just within a company, but within the industry as a whole about things that'll work and things that don't work and how to approach problems. I think external review boards, have been a great step in that direction. They bring the perspective from around the globe. They see facilities all over the world and see what's worked and what doesn't work, and they can share stories and indicate how it might apply to one facility or another or not apply to one facility or another. So I think the use of review boards, given their global perspective, is great for the industry. But I think we as engineer of records need to uh, be able to share with our colleagues those uh, things that work and that don't work. Perceptions. Uh, historically, tailing storage facilities have been considered a cost center, the tail end of the process. It's not making money. It's just the waste product. It goes out the back door and nobody's really concerned about it. But I think it is an essential part of the process and the tailing storage facilities generally will always outlive the mine. And the neglected TSF can eat up all the profits ever generated and more from a mine. Failure of a TSF can cripple a mining company. We need to change our perception and priorities if we're to sway the stakeholders perception of our industry. So I think we've, we've really got to challenge the current perception uh, we as engineers and scientists need to advocate for that and uh, um, provide the uh, driver for senior management to take these things seriously and fund the appropriate work it needs to change the culture. So what are some of the specific tactics? Uh, these are ones that we've developed and are implementing and, and changing and evolving at Stantec. They're not the only ones, maybe they're not the best, but we're throwing them out there for other people to consider. I'm sure other people are doing different things and uh, we would appreciate that the industry as a whole tries to put those on the table for all of us to learn from. But some things we've done and are doing. An EOR steering committee composed of active senior EORs and senior management has been established to just monitor and watch the work that we're doing in this field as an engineer of record. Uh, we're specifying requirements for an engineer of record scope of work, establishing guidelines for client selection, specifying types of uh, TSF designs where we would consider assuming the role of EOR, conditions under which we would not accept the EOR role for an existing facility, et cetera. Um, you know, it's very challenging to step into the role of EOR on an existing facility that's been there for 20, 30, 40 years, and there's a long history, which it will take a long, long time to get up to speed on, and you may never get up to speed on. 
So that makes it challenging. If there's an existing engineer of record engaged, I think it's to the benefit of the mining company to maintain that relationship because they have that institutional knowledge. But in, in some cases, there's uh, it's not possible and there has to be a change. We have uh, coordinated annual EOR summits, uh, internal summits that are hosted by the steering committee to review engineering of record work being performed globally. Uh, that promotes Stantec's best practices, what we've learned uh, from listening to industry trends. We share client feedback and discuss our approach to tailings management and what might need to change. We've been doing work for some large uh, multinational mining companies at their facilities around the world, but it's not always the same team working on those facilities. So we need to be talking to each other about how we approach the role of engineer of record and provides consistent services to that client around the globe. That's what they're expecting from us. And it's, but it's kind of hard work to make sure we do that. It takes a lot of communication, a lot of training, uh, a lot of uh, um, common knowledge between the teams working around the globe. Uh, we, we've been working at the com uh, senior committee level at identifying qualifications and work traits for EORs and DEORs, deputy EORs, uh, targeting specific project experience and staff interested in the EOR career path. You know, there's a lot of good engineers out there in the world, but not all of them are destined to be an engineer of record. It takes strong technical skills, strong understanding of geotechnical issues, but also takes leadership uh, skills, uh, people skills, and the ability to uh, stand up in front of senior management and tell them they have a problem, and this is how we need to address it. So those are kind of the skill sets we look for in people uh, and then try and identify the, those skills and mentor them and grow them and coach them into that role. The steering committee also uh, is pushing planning and, uh, and encouraging regular uh, field site inspections by the EOR team and the responsible dam engineer to understand construction procedures, CQA procedures, monitoring procedures, observe firsthand the performance of the facility. We need to seek out input from frontline staff and listen to their concerns to identify and address problems before they result in unintended consequences. We've conducted internal benchmarking tours where we've taken teams of EORs and deputy EORs and sent them to facilities in North America, South America, and Australia to view firsthand operational performance in different geologic settings, different topography, different climate. Um, there's all things that are unique to a facility. One of the drawbacks of an engineer record role is you tend to spend a lot of time on one or two facilities and your focus is very uh, tuned towards those sites, but it really helps to get out and look at other facilities because there's always things to learn about what to do or what not to do at those facilities. So that takes time, effort, and money by organizations to facilitate that training. I think we're all aware there's a shortage of tailing practitioners and qualified EOR staff industry-wide. Therefore, we've in initiated some company-wide procedures to try and attract people into that career path. We're hosting weekly uh, webinars inside the company for P that allow people to talk about technical expertise they have, experience they've had at tailing facilities, what they've done and what they, what they haven't done and what works and what doesn't work. And I'm amazed at the interest we've seen in that. There's been 50, 30, 40, 50, 60 people on those calls every week for an hour to learn about what other people have done and what expertise is in the company and who to talk to if you have an issue that needs to be addressed. So we're actively recruiting, training, mentoring, and coaching uh, deputy EORs and encouraging them to consider the career path uh, for, their, uh, for the work they do for the company. It's, it's a role that does not go up and down with market trends in the mining industry. We've all seen the big swings that have occurred in the mining industry, 
but this work uh, tailing facility doesn't stop or doesn't go away when the market is down. The same work is required to uh, for construction, construction monitoring, designing, instrumentation monitoring, uh, well beyond the life of a mine into closure. There are various uh, industry bodies, as I mentioned earlier, that are specifying uh, roles and responsibilities that should be included in engineer of record engagement. And those need to be uh, reviewed, taken seriously, and adopted by the engineer of record team, the responsible dam engineer team, uh, and all associated parties uh, engaged in a facility. Um, it's the only way we're going to change the culture. So in summary, just uh, five points I'd like to leave you with. Hopefully we've covered these and you've uh, been able to grasp them. But tailing management is serious business. And getting it wrong has serious consequences for our industry and the communities that support us. We've all seen that over the last couple of years. A culture that focuses on safety of tailing dam facilities is required to improve the performance of the industry. Culture has both above water and below water components. Senior managers often drive the above water components, but all staff define or should define the below water components. There are examples in the, in the industry, I've given you two, where a change in culture has resulted in improved performance. So I think this, uh, nobody can say that this culture thing is, is hogwash and should not be developed. It's been proven to change performance. I think if we adopt it, we can uh, improve our performance dramatically. All stakeholders have a critical role uh, to play in developing the uh, safety culture around TSFs. The EOR culture must be aligned with the culture of the owner, the regulator, and the community. And there are specific tactics that need to be developed for the below water components of culture within an EOR organization. I've touched on a few of those. There's more. I'm sure the group on this uh, webinar has got ideas on what we can do to improve that culture inside our organization and inside the industry as a whole. Uh, like I say, they're evolving, but they must be adopted by the engineer record team and implemented across the industry if we want to achieve the performance we all desire. Well, that's uh, my presentation. I'd be welcome to some questions or comments uh, from people that are on the call. Thank you, Pat, for an excellent presentation. I'd like to open up the question and answer period to our attendees. Uh, if you could use the chat panel, please. Our first question uh, you may have answered during your presentation. The question is, what were the challenges in establishing the EOR culture at Stantec, if any? Yes, uh, one, it was defining or finding the people that wanted to accept that role. It's, there's a larger responsibility that goes with it. As I indicated, there are certain traits that are required of an engineer of record and deputy engineer of record. And there was also uh, communicating to senior management that this is a serious role. I'll be honest, it carries or ca can carry certain liability. You can write contracts till you're blue in the face. Uh, to try and get protection, but if there's a failure at a facility, it's going to impact the company. And so our senior management, when we started communicating to them about this role, were concerned about how much liability goes with it. And after a lot of discussion, we were able to communicate to them that we have a process in place. The senior review committee for an EOR, uh, EOR uh, role, um, the vetting of clients and projects that are required before we accept that role, and that it's a long-term commitment. That when the market slows down inside the company, uh, we cannot just uh, respond to a request to lay off 10% of the staff. Um, we've got to maintain that staff to monitor these facilities, and we have to be recruiting and mentoring and finding new staff regardless of market conditions, to ensure a succession plan that would be part of what's required for an engineer of record role. We've had these discussions with our industry clients, and they strongly support that, that um, 
they recognize that we're going to have to be hiring and engaging people even during slow times in the industry because the role of an engineer of record doesn't change. Thank you. Our attendee says, very good. We're having the same experiences here. Our next Great question. Our next question says, many thanks for the presentation. Do you think that the amount of various efforts for any particular TSF is at least partially dependent upon its hazard classification, ignoring for the moment any negative behaviors the particular TSF may be exhibiting? Yes, uh, I, I think you have to uh, perform uh, risk assessments, hazard assessments, failure modes and consequence analysis uh, for each facility to uh, develop a scope of work that's appropriate for that facility. Is it in operations? Is it in closure? Uh, well, has it been characterized? I, I think the scope of work does change based on the potential hazard, based on the, uh, the past database knowledge base of that facility. Uh, you know, we're all dealing with uh, these existing facilities that were built years and years ago, and we know very little about them. And so they may require quite a bit of remedial investigation to understand what the hazard is and what the issue is. But I think the scope needs to be tailored to your particular situation. Thank you. Our next comment starts out by saying, excellent presentation. The question is, can you describe different structures for establishing a tailings review board and their pros and cons from a governance standpoint? How does EOR participate in this? Well, the one that I'm most familiar with is an independent review board that is uh, independent of the uh, designers, independent of the owner, and that they do not drive the design. Uh, I have seen examples where the designers are not playing a strong role and the review board is sort of by default uh, performing some of the design or providing recommendations so specific that they appear to be the design. But I think people need to realize they're just providing recommendations, inputs, that it's ultimately the designer which is in most cases the engineer of record that uh, actually implements the design, does the design, implements it, constructs it, and monitors it. Um, you know, uh, review boards are great. I think their input is good, but it's not something that has to be uh, adopted. Um, it's a, it's a back and forth between the owner, uh, the review board, and the engineering team, but ultimately it's a responsibility of the designer. Thank you. The next question, you spoke of vetting clients. What are the criteria you look for into a company to agree to be EOR of their TSF? Yes, uh, we've we've done a lot of that. And uh, you know, the, the the simplest criteria would be to uh, assess whether they buy into ICMMs uh, principles um, and actually implement those. The recommendations that they put out in the global tailing standards, are they willing to appoint a responsible dam engineer? Are they willing to establish a review board and engage them and listen to them and act on those recommendations? Are they willing to provide on-site staff for the engineer of record team so they can have their eyes in the field? that they can have people at the, uh, uh, at the work face uh, to identify problems and help the engineer of record uh, prioritize work tasks. Um, those are the things that we think are very important. We also think it's important to have a relationship with senior management in an organization and not just talk to a procurement manager about the role of an engineer of record but be able to talk to senior, management's, senior management that's involved with technical issues and know we have someone to go to if we run into an issue or a problem that we need to take up the, the management chain, that we've got uh, a relationship that we can rely on to communicate that message. So those are some of the things that we look at. Uh, the past performance 
of uh, the company, uh, the, the history of the senior management team. Um, you know, there are junior mining companies that uh, find properties and really just want to get a permit so they can potentially sell the property. We're not necessarily interested in that role. Um, it's, it's a long-term role and it, it's, uh, it, it takes communication and knowledge of both organizations to make that assessment. Thank you. Our next uh, attendee mentions that he is from Brazil. His question is, I'd like to know your opinion about EORs developing the design for a raising of a dam. Do you think there's a problem of conflict of interest? Well, it depends on whether they've been involved from the start. If they're uh, designing a raise to a, a, a dam that they've been involved with, um, I think it's it's appropriate for them to because they know the history, they know what it's based on, they know the constraints. To come into a dam that's been constructed over the last 20 years and come in and say, just design me a five meter raise for this facility, that's tough. That's hard. I think it takes a lot of uh, evaluation, a lot of discussion with the client to take on that role because no matter what you do, you're never going to understand that history uh, as well as if you were the designer and were there throughout that. Um, can't always turn down work. Uh, you, you know, you, you want to help out a client, but there's some serious risks associated with just doing a, a raise on a dam that's been built there for years. Um, uh, my guidance would be to be careful. Thank you. Excellent advice. Our next question, for a geotechnical engineer interested in an EOR role, to what extent do we need to gain understanding and knowledge of other disciplines, for instance, hydrology, to understand the various interdisciplinary components of the project as a whole? Yeah, good question. Um, you know, an engineer of record uh, cannot be everything. <laughs> cannot be an expert in everything. That's why, you know, the specific traits of an engineer of record role are important. They need to be somebody that has a, a specific technical discipline, preferably in the geotechnical arena, but understands what impacts that. Hydrology, surface water control, um, geochemistry, all those things come into play. I think what the engineer of record needs to do is to be knowledgeable of where his expertise is limited and turn to other people within his company or possibly outside his company for the expertise that he needs to evaluate that facility. Um, so I, I think it's totally appropriate to go to outside consultants if that's where the expertise is to help an engineer of record make a decision. Can turn to internal resources within the company, but it takes a team um, because an engineer of record can't be an expert in everything. Thank you. I'd like to uh, remind our audience that this webinar was being recorded. It will be posted on the SME website within a week or so. You will receive an email from SME letting you know how to download the presentation at your convenience. Uh, Pat, that seems to be the last of the questions. Thank you so much for sharing your expertise with us. Would you have any final words for our audience? Uh, no, I think the engineer of record role is is a great career path. Um, been very satisfying for me, very exciting, very interesting, and our industry needs it. So I would encourage all of you to consider it if it's appropriate. Thank you again, Stantec, for sponsoring this webinar. It was fantastic and very well attended. This ends today's session. Have a good day and a safe day, everyone. Take care. <laughs>